Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you are joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world, and we are so thrilled to start off another epic school year with you. This is just our fourth broadcast that we've done to kick off the year. Last year, you guys joined us for 550 plus sessions, so thank you so much for keeping us uh, going, keeping us excited, and pumped up about all these amazing people and stories for an entire year, the weirdest year in your entire lives as teachers and students. And it is so nice to see so many kids in the classroom back again. And it's such a pleasure and privilege to get to bring you these amazing stories. So whether you're joining us live or on YouTube, Welcome back in. I am so excited to dive in with today's presentation. Before we get underway with who we're joined with, I did want to know we are trying out something a little bit different this year. And so after our talk and before our Q&A, if you guys want to join us on Kahoot, I know some teachers are familiar with this, check out Kahoot.it. We're going to do a brief little one and a half, two minute quiz to test your guys' understanding and have a little fun game at the end. So check that out and you'll get the code right when we dive in with that quiz. Now, earlier today, I got the chance to go to Duke Lemur Center for the Lemur Forest, playing around with amazing creatures in the woods. Joe's been doing programs on plastic pollution, but today we're doing something a little bit, fair, or not a little bit, very different. We are going to learn about teeth, claws, and dinosaurs, and we are joined by education specialist Russell Hawley at the Casper College Tate Geological Museum. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Russell to blow our minds, and I cannot wait to dive in. Russell, thanks so much for joining us today, man. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, always good to talk about uh, Wyoming's dinosaur resources with people from all over the world. But it, it's important to remember that dinosaurs are found throughout the United States and also quite a few in Canada as well. I've uh, got some models here to, uh, to illustrate um, this. And, and don't call them toys. These are scale models, all right? If you call them toys, it makes me feel really bad about continuing to collect these things at my advanced age. But uh, this is a dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis. And that means the thick-nosed reptile from Canada. And Canada is indeed where this sort of dinosaur has been found. Not a not a pretty dinosaur, but certainly an interesting one. So there's uh, Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis. Uh, here is another dinosaur, kind of looks like a Tyrannosaurus rex, but it's smaller. It lived earlier in time, and uh, it was found in Alberta, Canada, hence the name Albertasaurus. So here's another Canadian dinosaur. And uh, here, I think, is my favorite Canadian dinosaur. This is Styracosaurus. Styracosaurus. And actually, this guy is um, made to the same scale as uh, the Albertosaurus, and they lived at the same time. So in Alberta, Canada, um, from time to time, Albertosaurus would run into Styracosaurus. This is a carnivore. This is an herbivore. He might have tried to eat this guy, but as you can see, that would have been a pretty hazardous undertaking. And in addition to dinosaurs, fossil invertebrates have been found in Canada, including uh, British Columbia. And British Columbia is where this very strange creature was found. It seems to be distantly related to... Um, the ancestors of modern arthropods, things like shrimp and lobsters. And uh, it, but it's so different, it's so weird, it's been placed in a class of its own. Anyways, it's it's named Anomalocaris, which loosely translates as mystery shrimp, way older than dinosaurs. This is uh, over 500 million years old. So this was extinct long before the dinosaurs came along, a truly ancient beast. But, Dinosaurs are what I'm mostly going to be focusing on. Uh, Wyoming is one of the best places anywhere in the United States to find dinosaurs. In fact, more dinosaurs have been found in Wyoming than any other state except for Montana. So if you're going to dig up dinosaurs, uh, this is a good place to uh, end up. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is an example of a fossil. Everything we know about dinosaurs, we have to learn from studying fossils, things like bones and footprints dug up from under the ground. You can't go out and look at a live dinosaur. There aren't any more. So uh, here's an example of a fossil. Now, uh, I, I can't hear you, but 
you can hear you and your teacher and your classmates can hear you. So when I count to three, you're going to tell me what part of the dinosaur um, this fossil came from. One, two, three, say it. And I trust that everybody out there is saying tooth. <laughs> yes, indeed, this is a tooth. You can see the kids like losing it in the background. It's a lot of fun. I can bring them in, by the way. If you do have any more queries for kids, I can bring in one class at a time to answer things on camera if you'd like. Just let me know. All righty. Um, sure, if you don't mind selecting a uh, class to answer my next question, it is this. What dinosaur did this tooth come from? All right, we've got Miss Moore's grade five joining us in Alabama. If you guys want to come on in, what do you think? What dinosaur is the tooth from? T-Rex! And that is correct. Tyrannosaurus Rex. You guys called him T-Rex for short. That's okay. He doesn't mind. Um, so, yeah, that is a Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth. By the way, here's a piece of trivia. Tyrannosaurus Rex had the biggest teeth of any dinosaur. You might get asked that on Jeopardy someday, so try to remember it. All right, and here is my model of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, this model is 40 times smaller than the real thing. So the real Tyrannosaurus Rex would be 40 times bigger. So it would look quite a bit larger if you saw the real thing. It would look, it would look like this. Um, if you saw the real thing, it would look more like this. Wait, where's that camera? Oh, unless it was hungry, in which case it would look just like this. Um, but I've drawn a human skeleton here. 40 times smaller than the real thing. So this is how tall I would look standing next to a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I come up about to his knee. Um, now, many of you are probably shorter than I am. So I imagine there's a few of you who would only look this tall uh, next to the Tyrannosaurus Rex, not all the way up to his knee, but rather up to his ankle. So to the T-Rex, you would be a little ankle biter. So that's uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, by the way. The first Tyrannosaurus Rex ever found was found right here in Wyoming. So I'm speaking to you from the heart of Tyrannosaurus Rex country. In the years since then, they've also been found in South Dakota. The biggest and most complete ones keep on turning up in South Dakota for some reason. They've been found in Colorado, Montana. The farthest north Tyrannosaurus Rex has been found is Alberta, Canada. Yay! So uh, here is another Tyrannosaurus Rex tooth. Now, this one's just a cast of the crown, but it's really high resolution. And if I hold this up to the camera here, hopefully you can see a row of little bumps there. See those guys? Those are called serrations. They're like the jags on the edge of a steak knife, and they help the teeth slice into the meat better when he bit into something. Notice also how thick round and strong this tooth is in cross-section. So this was a very strong tooth, but thanks to those serrations, it was also, um, it also retained its uh, cutting function. So Tyrannosaurus kind of got the best of both worlds that way. So that is a dinosaur tooth. Now here is another fossil from a different kind of dinosaur. Um, animals that eat nothing but meat have a special name. Can anybody tell me what we call an animal that eats nothing but meat? Hmm, I'm gonna bring in, let's see. Oh, I think we've got some hands up in Miss Comes Class. What do you guys think of Astoria? There we go, yep, yep, carnivore. That is correct. And then there's other animals that eat nothing but plants. And uh, we call those herbivores. I know I should have let you guess, but I thought <laughs> I'd save us some time. Here's a good example of an herbivore. This is Brontosaurus. It's a dinosaur near and dear to my heart because the first dinosaur that I ever helped dig up was a Brontosaurus. And we dug it up near the town of Medicine Bow, right here in Wyoming. So Brontosaurus is a herbivore. It's a plant eater. If you ever saw one, you wouldn't have to worry about it trying to eat you because they weren't interested in eating meat, certainly not eating um, grade school students. Now, you don't want it to step on you because these things weigh about 20 tons. Now, you might wonder, hey, wait a minute, how do you know that? How do we know how much a dinosaur weighed? You can't just ask a dinosaur to step on the bathroom scale for you for a variety of reasons. Um, if you're curious about how we figure out how dinosaurs how we figure out how dinosaurs, um, how much they weighed, you can go to YouTube and then type in Tate Talk 
volume displacement, spelled just like you got it right up there. Tate Talk volume displacement. And we've put together a little instructional video um, showing you how you can figure out how much a dinosaur uh, weighed using, by the way, plastic models. So it might be something a little bit more interesting to do with your toys than make them fight with each other. All right. These guys uh, would squash you like a bug if they stepped on you. Now here is a claw on its thumb. See that? And then there's a big claw on the other thumb. And uh, I've got one of those right here. Ta -da! That's a big claw, but it's a big animal. So that makes sense. Uh, you can tell that this is a claw and not a tooth because of this thing right here. The blood groove. Um, when she was alive, there was a blood vessel running along that groove to bring nutrients to her thumbnail. Teeth don't have that. So if you ever find a pointy dinosaur bone and you want to know, is this a tooth or is it a claw? Well, you just look for the blood groove. If you say it in that creepy voice, it'll help you remember. And if it's got that blood groove, it's a claw, not a tooth, but a claw. So I'm going to hold this close to the screen so you can get a good close look at this claw. I especially want you to make sure that you get a good close look at the what? The blood groove. All right, moving along. Now, Tyrannosaurus rex lived at the end of the Cretaceous period, but if you were walking around the Jurassic period, um, you would have to worry about a very different sort of dinosaur. And it's this guy right here. This is Allosaurus. This is a model of Allosaurus. It's uh, the most abundant meat-eating dinosaur in Wyoming during the Jurassic period. So if you came to Wyoming and then went back in time, 150 million years, and walked around, this is what would eat you, the Allosaurus, most likely. There's a couple of different ways you can tell it apart from a T-Rex. One is size. Happily, both of these models are 1 40th scale. So uh, as you can see, the Tyrannosaurus rex is about three times bigger than your average Allosaurus. So that's one difference. Another, I've already alluded to, time period. Tyrannosaurus rex lived at the end of the Cretaceous. Allosaurus lived at the end of the Jurassic period. By the time Tyrannosaurus rex came along, <laughs> Allosaurus had been extinct for 90 million years. So no chance of them ever encountering each other. And a final uh, difference is the number of fingers. A Tyrannosaurus rex only has two fingers on each hand, but an Allosaurus has a three-fingered hand, three fingers on each hand. So there's another difference as well. Here is an Allosaurus tooth. And the tooth is flattened from side to side like a knife blade. See that? That's a very good shape for slicing and cutting. That would have been very useful when dinner time came along. But it's also a little on the delicate side. If Allosaurus bit into something while it was still thrashing around, some of these delicate teeth might break off. That's why Allosaurus claws are shaped like this. Da -dum! They're curved almost double. They would have tapered to a wicked point when he was alive. And they're thick round in cross-section. This is the perfect shape of claw for grabbing and holding. We think that's what they would do. They'd rush up to the prey animal, grab it, sink the points of those claws in, and then hold it steady while he bit into it with his teeth. So uh, if you want to know what a dinosaur ate, you look at the shape of its teeth. If you want to know how it killed its prey, if it's a carnivore, and you want to know how it killed its prey, look at the shape of its claws. That uh, can be an important clue. Now here is an Allosaurus tailbone, one of its caudal vertebrae. And uh, this middle part is called the centrum. None of this will be on the test, by the way. And uh, it's flat-ended, and there's a pair of prongs uh, coming off the front and another prong on the back. Now when these tail vertebrae are all lined up together, each one of these prongs fits in between the two forward-facing prongs on the vertebra behind, and then these two will bracket the uh, backward-pointing spine on the vertebra ahead. That locks all the tailbones together to make it stiff, and that way the Allosaurus could walk or run on two legs, holding out the tail for balance, and that way he wouldn't fall over on his nose when he was running around. So that's a good shape of tail vertebra to have if you are a biped, a two-legged dinosaur. Now, here are some very different tail bones. Here's one, and then here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. There's a dinosaur that had 40 of these things lined up at the tip of its tail, and I've got a model of him right here. This is Diplodocus. 
And Diplodocus is the longest dinosaur that's known from a complete skeleton. It's longer than a Brontosaurus, but it didn't weigh as much because a Brontosaurus is a pretty short, thick, heavy, robust animal. Uh, Diplodocus is longer, but most of that length is long, skinny neck and long, skinny tail, which adds a lot to the total number of meters, um, but it doesn't add a whole lot to its mass. Anyways, so yeah, those last 40 bones at the tip of its tail looked like this, and they made a long, thin whiplash. And notice that the vertebrae are not flat-ended, so these ball-on-ball -ball joints made it very flexible. No interlocking prongs uh, locking them together either. So the end of its tail was like a gigantic piece of overcooked spaghetti. Very flexible indeed. Now, why is that? We think it may have been a weapon. Every herbivore had to have some way of keeping itself from getting eaten by the carnivores. And in the case of Diplodocus, it might have been that tail whip. If he was being attacked by an allosaurus, he may have been able to whip him with his tail and hurt him and drive him away. Ay, 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 ay. That's him being driven away there. Here's a repeat of that super technical scientific demonstration. Ay, 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 ay. All righty. So uh, those tail bones are the shape to make a defensive weapon, a tail whip, or uh, an another comparison that might have occurred to you, a gigantic 40 long segment set of nunchucks. All righty. I've got another trivia question for you. Where do baby dinosaurs come from? Do we have any takers on this one? Mm. I also, I love the demonstration, by the way. The technical diagrams are the absolute best part of this. Uh, what I want to do is go to Errol Village. we got some kids. Uh, if you guys want to unmute your mic in Errol Village, come on in. And where do baby dinosaurs come from? Take a second. No hurry. We're hey, everybody, there. where do they come from? Eggs! That's <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Um, not to denigrate the, the uh, preschoolers, but when I asked the preschoolers that, they said, from their mommies. Uh, eggs is a much better answer, much more precise. And what I've got here is a dinosaur egg. Uh, this is the egg of a dinosaur called Oviraptor. And if you haven't seen one of those, I've got, oh yes, another model right here. And I'm going to turn it around because this is a beautiful model. They did a really good job on this guy. Oviraptor is related to the sorts of dinosaurs that gave rise to birds. And itself, it would have been uh, rather bird-like in appearance. So this gets up to about the size of an adult human being, about my size, as a matter of fact. Now we look at the egg and we can work out the size of the baby oviraptor. The baby had to be small enough to fit into a space only that big. So when it was first hatched, it wasn't any bigger than a guinea pig. Uh, no, no, smaller than that. Look at that. Uh, this is about rat sized, rat sized. Sorry, I skipped my rodents. Um, so yeah, rat sized as a baby, then growing up to be a full-sized adult. And by the way, um, scientists in Mongolia have found fossil finds indicating that Oviraptor guarded the eggs and took care of uh, its babies after they hatched. Not like a turtle. A turtle is a lousy parent. It lays its eggs and then ditches them. The babies hatch and they never even see their mum or their dad. But uh, we believe that uh, Oviraptors were uh, catching lizards and things and coming back to the nest and feeding little babies. And as a matter of fact, you can even see that on the model. We've got some of these eggs hatching and this one here already hatched and probably thinking, I'm hungry. When do I eat? So Oviraptor, relatively small dinosaur. Here's a much larger dinosaur. This is called a hadrosaur. And um, uh, if you forget the word hadrosaur, you can call it a duckbill dinosaur because it had a beak shaped like the bill of a duck. And uh, these have been found not only here in the United States, but quite a few of them. Oh, hey, and that's how you spell it. All right, that was very useful. Um, in Canada, very, uh, very abundant in Canada. So this is a rhinoceros sized animal. This gets up to three or four tons live weight, about the size of a rhinoceros. But look at the egg. The egg is only this big. All right, that's bigger than a chicken egg, no doubt about that. But the baby hadrosaur, small enough to fit inside of this egg, is only about the size of a guinea pig. Um, yes, that's, that's why I mentioned guinea pigs earlier. I got mixed up. All right, but this, that's the right size for a guinea pig to fit in there. So starting out guinea pig sized and growing up to rhinoceros sized. They must have had to eat a lot in order to get up to their full adult size. So very great disparity between the size of the juvenile and the size of the adult in these hadrosaurs. 
Well, I've been talking for about 20 minutes now. So uh, if uh, you like, we can move on to your, um, your quiz or I can uh, show another uh, bone. You know what? Show another bone because this has been so, so much fun. I'd love to hear about one more thing, especially if there's a chance of a blood group. I mean, this is well, just, all right. Maybe yeah. not. I don't know. I don't want to spoil it, but ping something else and then we'll do that quiz and I'll, I'll announce the other classes before we dive in with Q&A. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I'll give you guys a, a quiz. I'm going to show you a dinosaur tooth. And now you tell me, did this dinosaur eat plants or meat? Hmm, let's see Mr. Pettix's class. You guys want to unmute in California. Plants or meat? We learned a little bit earlier that the teeth are really a big deal when it comes to what they go for. What do we think? Uh, meat! Oh, yeah. oh, so, therefore, is it an herbivore or a carnivore? Hmm, what do you guys do remember? Kind of, we're, we're waffling, we're waffling. Carnivore! <laughs> you have been paying attention. Yeah, so a carnivore, a um, meat eater. This is the tooth of Giganotosaurus from South America. And it had teeth that are sharp on the edges, pointed at the tip, and each tooth curves back towards the throat. And every reptile in the world today that has teeth that shape is a meat eater, a carnivore. And so we are very... Uh, certain that meat was the diet of the Giganotosaurus from South America. All righty. And uh, now the last uh, thing I'm going to show you is another quiz. I've got a fossil here. I've got a fossil. Don't say anything yet. Don't say anything yet. Now, tell me, is this a tooth or a claw? Hmm, Mr. Hancock's class in Georgetown. Unmute your mic. What do you think? Tooth or claw, guys? What do we think, everybody? Wow. Very good. You know what? They must have spotted the blood group. <laughs> yep. This claw goes on the hand of a very strange dinosaur called a therizinosaur. Here's what a therizinosaur looked like, and it had these big, scary claws on its hands there. Now, why did I say it was strange? Well, even though it's got these frightening, menacing, dangerous-looking claws, it had little leaf-shaped teeth for shredding plants. It's an herbivore. So why does an herbivore need, ooh, yeah, that's how you spell therizinosaur. Excellent, ooh, there. Um, why does an herbivore need those claws? Well, here's a couple of ideas. One is that they might be self-defense. If a, a carnivore was trying to eat it, he could scratch at it with those claws and hurt it and drive it away. Another idea, hooking tree branches and bringing leaves. <gasps> down to the level of the mouth, or digging up uh, roots and tubers from under the ground is another possible use for this claw. Um, so that is the claw of the Therizinosaur. Okay, and now I think we can turn it over to quiz time. Fantastic, Russell, what a great time that was. Thank you so, so much. Your enthusiasm is beyond infectious. And so yes, as he said, we are gonna go live to our quiz. So what I'm gonna do now is bring this up as a banner. If you guys are on kahoot.it with a little slash, you can use the code below. I'm also gonna bring this up in screen sharing. And what we can do is go through this quiz together, uh, see what you guys get. We've had over a hundred people join us for our other two quizzes. So I'm so excited to have you guys join in. Um, and we'll wait for players for a second. While we're waiting for players, a shout out to all sorts of classes on YouTube as well. We've got groups in California, Alaska, Alberta, Ontario, Minnesota. So welcome in Miss Shelton, Miss Tamash. We've got Miss Ross, Miss Smith, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Till, Miss McDermott, Miss Hiscox, and so many more. It is so exciting to have you guys on today. And you're coming in. We've got 16 so far. I'm going to give it another 30 seconds or so. Keep coming in. You guys know your name. We've got the built-in names on the screen to join us, and we will get underway with our quiz. And maybe Russell can give us clues in the middle of the quiz. It's about 20 seconds per thing. We'll see what you guys think. So I'm going to begin this, and let's get underway. All right. Question one, people. I'm excited. This is an open-ended one. All right. Hmm. What is your favorite kind of dinosaur? What do we got? Let's see. Sauropods, like our Brachiosaurus, like our Brontosaurus, T-Rex, Raptors, I know a lot of you know Raptors, or others. Any other kind of thing we maybe learned about today? Anything that you've heard about in other things? Russell, what's your favorite kind of dinosaur? 
Happily, I've got one right here. Carosaurus. <laughs> this was the most abundant dinosaur in Wyoming during the Jurassic period. And I think it's a pretty good looking animal too. And I've helped dig up a couple of them. So yeah, Camerasaurus, near and dear to my heart. How cool is that? T-Rex is our, our winner in that one. There's no points for that one, but it's good to know you guys. <laughs> good to know. All right. When did most dinosaurs go extinct? Our second question. Oh no, we got... We have an angry picture. 16 seconds left. Is it a billion years ago? Is it three weeks last Tuesday? I don't know. 500,000, 65 million? What do we think, guys? Russell, where, where are we thinking for our well, final five seconds here? Any hints? Hmm. Well, does anybody remember how long ago I said Tyrannosaurus lived? Because he was one of the last dinosaurs. Yeah, most people got that one right. 29 for 65 million. One of my favorite facts about dinosaurs is that a lot of us know Stegosaurus as well. A lot of us know T-Rex. T-Rex is closer to us than he was to Stegosaurus, which is really hard to wrap your mind around, but it's super, super cool. So in terms of points, Agile Eagles got the lead right now. Let's go to our third question. True or false? Birds or dinosaurs? There's a little nuance here in how you might want to answer this, but we've got 20 seconds. What do you guys think as we're coming in? Hmm. Certainly I know when I was a kid, everyone thought one thing, and I think it sort of changed over time. Pretty exciting in the world. We got five seconds left. You guys are doing a great job. So many answers. All right, let's see what we got. It is true. Most of you got that right. Way to go, guys. So birds, Russell, are the last living, I guess, group of dinosaurs. They've changed over time, of course, but our last big group that came from that time. Yes, indeed. Very, very cool. And then one final question. Let's see what the scoreboard's doing. Groovy Wombat is taking the lead. The faster you answer, the better you guys get. Final true or false question. The biggest animal ever was a dinosaur. True or false? 10 seconds. Mm, you can think like that girl. What's she thinking about? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Three, two, one. And the answer is false. Some of you knew that. So dinosaurs were huge. They're gigantic. We talked about some of the big ones. We got kids like losing their minds in Miss Morris class. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miss Morris class. You guys rock. We got some data going on too. Um, so the answer to this is the blue whale, the largest animal ever to exist on this planet, lives right now way bigger than any dinosaur. Great job, guys. Let's see what our final tally in the quiz was. The podium. We've got third place. All right. Funny Lurk. We've got our second place. Oh, these are fun. Radiant Unicorn. I wish I was a Radiant Unicorn. And number one, the champion today in the quiz, Lovely Elk. Good Aww. job, guys. That was so much fun. All right, and with that, I'm going to pull off our banner here. We are going to dive in with questions. So I'm going to go to our live classes first, take some from YouTube, and we are going to dive in with Russell. So, Errol Village, our, our school joining us. Uh, if you guys want to come on in, in Kamlachi, Ontario, grade six is Miss Newman's group. Come unmute that mic, and you are good to go to kick us off with a question. Welcome in, guys. <laughs> Let's bring anyone up who wants to come. Don't be shy. Riley, come on up. Yes, yeah, Sawyer, just hold on a sec, honey. All right, Riley. Um, what what was the biggest living dinosaur ever? That's a good question. Fortunately, I've got a model. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm a uh, I'm obsessive. Uh, this is called Brachiosaurus, and Brachiosaurus is the biggest dinosaur that's known from a complete skeleton. Now, I had to qualify that because of an unfortunate little rule of thumb that I've learned over the years. I call it Peter Dodson's Law. The bigger the dinosaur, the less likely you are to find the whole skeleton. So this is Brachiosaurus, and it's the biggest dinosaur known from a complete skeleton. But there's another dinosaur called Futalongosaurus. It's kind of an ironic name because the actual animal was a whole lot more than a Futalong. But Futalongosaurus <laughs> may have been bigger than Brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus is probably around 30, maybe 40 tons. Futalongosaurus was closer to 50 tons. But nobody has yet found its head, its arms, its legs, or its tail. <laughs> so <Is> that all? <laughs> it's, uh, incompletely known. And then there's an even bigger dinosaur called Argentinosaurus from Argentina, uh, mm. so it's not just her name, and that dinosaur may have been as much as 70 tons, but it's only known from six bones. They've got five vertebrae and one tibia, and that's it. So the, uh, the rule of thumb, Peter Dodson's law, makes it kind of difficult to nail down exactly which dinosaur was the biggest one. 
Yeah, great question to kick us off, guys. And I know we've got a big Ontario audience today. For our people near Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum has a food Alongosaurus cast in its no lobby. So you want to check that out? It's pretty awesome. cool. It's one of my favorite things when I was a kid. Um, let's go to Miss Leffert's class. We've got hands up all over the place. You guys are so enthusiastic. I love it. So Miss Leffert's class is joining us today in Topeka and Kansas. Welcome in, guys, and come on up. Hey, yeah, you're good to go. How did the dinosaurs with massive teeth not hurt get their mouths hurt? Like, yeah. whoo, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I guess it kind of depends on um, what the soft tissue looked like. Because in a uh, meat eating dinosaur, you've got an upper jaw with the teeth coming down and the lower jaw with the teeth poking up. But the upper jaw is always a bit longer and a bit uh, wider than the lower jaw. So when it closes its mouth, those lower teeth fit kind of inside that row of the upper teeth. And uh, the upper teeth in dinosaurs with relatively short teeth, they probably fit into a lip. There would have been a lip between the lower teeth and the, uh, um, and the upper teeth would fit in between that lip and the lower teeth. But in dinosaurs with really long teeth, like Tyrannosaurus rex, they probably poked outside of the lip. So even if a Tyrannosaurus rex had his mouth closed, you probably would have seen the points of those uh, upper teeth poking out from underneath its upper lip. Um, some, some house cats are like that. Uh, so if uh, you um, saw a live Tyrannosaurus, you'd see the tips of its upper teeth poking out. And that way, they didn't poke into the bottom of its lower lip and uh, and hurt himself. Weird question. I've never heard that question before, so thank you. No, I mean, a variety in my cool. life. I think we should all do our best T-Rex impression now if we can. Yeah. But yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. One thing you talked about earlier, which I love, is this idea of teeth as form and function. So I'd like all our students, feel your own teeth. You've got some sharp teeth. You've got some slicing teeth. You've got some flat teeth at the back. No, we're having teachers telling me no. Um, <laughs> so your teeth are omnivorous. You have teeth that are designed to eat plants and meat both, which is really, really cool and something that we can see in ourselves. Um, maybe not in the classroom. It's, it's COVID. Wear your mask. Um, all right. Mr. Hancock, I'm going to go to Georgetown. Uh, if you have a question for us, and then I'll take a few from YouTube before going to our other live classes. Mr. Hancock, come on up. Yeah, definitely. No, we got all our masks on here. Um, we had some <laughs> students here who are curious. They've heard of the theory and the idea behind the dinosaurs and the meteorite causing the extinction. Uh, are there any other theories or any other ideas about what could have happened to the dinosaurs? There are actually. The um, meteor idea is still the most popular one. I think probably more paleontologists think it was that, that asteroid hitting the Earth than any other idea. But there are um, a couple of other contenders out there. My own, um, one of our own uh, uh, geology professors here at uh, the uh, Tate Museum, Dr. Kent Sindel, thinks that volcanoes had a lot to do with the dinosaur extinction. There was massive volcanic activity at the end of the Cretaceous, belching out um, volcanic ash and soot and smoke and, and poisonous gases and creating acid rain and all sorts of other stuff happening, happening at the end of the Cretaceous. He thinks that the dinosaurs were already on the skids because of all this volcanic activity and that the asteroid was just kind of the coup de grace. And then there's a scientist I used to work for back in the uh, 90s, Dr. Robert Bacher, who thinks that it was epidemics of foreign diseases. He thinks that as the dinosaurs crossed from one continent to another, they would um, uh, introduce foreign diseases to the local native populations. Uh, they'd have no defense against it, no immunity, kind of like what we're going through here, our own species. And uh, so he thinks that the dinosaurs mostly died out from disease at uh, the end of the Cretaceous period. So there you go, different ideas, but still the asteroid definitely has the lead. I always love the asteroid story. It's so, so cool. If you read some of the, the books or dinosaurs for kids, even talking about what that would have been like, the experience of such a sizable rock, about the size of Mount Everest hitting the earth at the speed it was coming in is just unbelievable. So great question, Mr. Hancock. Um, Miss Cump, I know you guys have to go in about 10 minutes, so I want to bring you in, and then we'll take those YouTube questions, and we probably have time for a whole other round. We are whipping through these, because Russell is great with these answers. So Miss Cump's class has joined us in Astoria, New York. Come on up, unmute that mic. In fact, all our teachers, unmute your mics. It's only uh, when you're in the background. It's good. Welcome in, guys. Um, if humans weren't alive when dinosaurs were around, how do we know that they look like? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, one simple answer to that question. We don't. 
<laughs> you can look at a dinosaur's skeleton and figure out some things about how it uh, how it looked. Um, well, let me give you a, an example. Here is a dinosaur skull. So by looking at the shape of this skull, we can tell that this dinosaur had big eyes. Look at that eye socket. Nice big eye right there. We can tell where its nose was right there at the tip of its snout. We can tell that its uh, head was very long and very low and that it had very sharp little teeth. Um, here's the other side. You can see more of those little sharp little teeth right there. So if we want to draw a picture of what this dinosaur looked like, we can uh, put an eye in that eye socket and then cover the rest with skin. And we end up with a head that looks something like this because that skull that I just showed you, that's the skull of a velociraptor. But there's a lot of things we don't know about what they looked like. For example, the skin texture. Nobody's ever found a velociraptor's skin. After it dies, the skin rots away and leaves nothing. So the, they imagined for many years that it had kind of reptilian skin. But then later on, people found that a velociraptor has quill knobs on the trailing edge of its ulna, just like a turkey does. Quill knobs support the primary, I'm sorry, the secondary, the secondary wing feathers. So if a velociraptor has quill knobs, it must have had wing feathers. If it had feathers on its wings, it must have had feathers all over its body. Maybe the velociraptor didn't look like this, but more like, like this. So, Very so that might be closer to the life appearance of a velociraptor than, uh, than this model here. And for decades, people had no idea. <laughs> so yeah, there's always some guesswork involved. And especially when it comes to color. If you draw a picture of a dinosaur, when it's time to color it, you know what color to make it? Whatever color you want. Nobody can tell you you're wrong. This is the thing with I absolutely love. I mean, one of the examples you talked about sort of trying to intuit the rest of the flesh, the rest of the body, or just a skeleton. Look up an elephant skull when you're done this program, all our students, and it looks nothing like what an elephant looks like. You never get a sense of the ears. You don't get a sense of the tusks necessarily. The trunk isn't there in the skull. So you get this, you draw this completely different animal than what actually exists because it's hard to make that sort of picture. Same with color. You know, a lot of dinosaurs and dioramas are green or brown. Well, look at the colors of wildlife nowadays and lizards and birds and all these amazing things. And dinosaurs would have had that color too. They would have reflected that in so many ways. It's such a cool story. I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, Ms. Cowell. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to take a couple from YouTube and then we're going to go to Miss Moore and Mr. Pedix's class right after that. So joining us in Delta Junction, Alaska, all the way north of you guys, uh, Ms. Tomash's class wants to know how big was the biggest dinosaur egg? Ah, the biggest dinosaur egg is about the size of a honeydew melon. Um, and then there's others that are longer than that, but not as big around. And they're about the size of a, of a nice big loaf of bread. So those are the biggest dinosaur eggs. And that's still very small if you consider that the biggest dinosaur adults were um, as big as multiple elephants. So a uh, baby, a newly hatched Brachiosaurus would have looked almost microscopically small uh, compared to the adults. So once again, they had to eat a lot. Um, most dinosaur eggs are roughly the size of a potato, and the smallest dinosaur eggs that have ever been found uh, are about the size of a grape. So there were big dinosaurs and little ones, and they laid uh, eggs ranging from little to big. But even the biggest dinosaur eggs aren't as big as you might think. My favorite point about this is that the biggest egg ever, and to my knowledge, the actual, like, arguably the biggest egg that can exist is from a much more recent creature, the elephant bird. So in Madagascar, you've got these eggs that are like this big. It's something I've always wanted to see in person. And they're about the structural limit of what an egg can be. Like, they're so big that if they were bigger, the shell would have to be too thick that the thing couldn't break out from inside. Just super, right. super. Big. So glad we got the egg question. Um, Mr. Till uh, is joining us in St. Paul, Minnesota with a third grader and a kindergartner. And he wants to know whether they're more herbivores or carnivores. Ooh, I'm glad you asked that question because it's actually a very important one. Um, when we dig up dinosaur bones in every formation that we've looked at, and uh, this is true uh, pretty much all over the world, the plant eaters outnumber the meat eaters by about 30 to 1. So in terms of individuals found, you find lots and lots of the plant eaters and only a few of the meat eaters. Um, in all of the time that I was digging up dinosaurs back in the 90s, I found a whopping total of one um, 
carnivore claw, but found lots of Camarasaurus bones and Stegosaurus and Diplodocus and Brontosaurus and uh, the uh, plant eaters. And if you think about it, this isn't too different from uh, our modern world. You might go on safari and see during the course of a day hundreds of zebras and wildebeest and gazelles, but probably only uh, a few lions or leopards or hyenas. Uh, the herbivores greatly outnumber the carnivores. My favorite example of this that a lot of students uh, might have seen is Zootopia. The movie Zootopia has it where the society oh, yeah, is built yeah. out of about 10 herbivores for every carnivore, which is really, really neat. Um, a little bit more, as Russell was mentioning, in the actual wild, but uh, a great representation of that. What a cool question. We've had some really unique questions today. Oh, wow. It's a great start to the year. Um, Time flies and you're having fun. We're at the 40 minute mark. So what I want to do is go to our live classes, maybe take one or two more from our YouTube groups, and then we will wrap up from there. So Miss Moore's class joining us in Huntsville, Alabama. If you guys want to come on in, go for it. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, how old were the T-Rexes before they died? Yeah. Have you guys had some sort of a contest to see who co could come up with the best question? Because these are all really good, really interesting questions. What I really like about these questions is that um, they're questions that I know the answer to. <laughs> Although up until recently, I didn't know the answer to that question and neither did anybody else. Nobody knew that there was any way to tell how old a dinosaur was when it died. How long did they live? Nobody knew. Um, I read some books when I was a kid that pointed out that reptiles grow slowly. So if you see a big reptile, you are looking at an old reptile. A big, big full-size crocodile is probably around 50 or 60 years old. A really big tortoise is probably pushing 100. And so they figured, what about something brontosaurus-sized? How, uh, how long did it take them to get up to their full size? And they figured that these guys probably lived about 200 years, a really, really long time. But that was just a guess, and it turned out that it was dead wrong. Uh, people started sectioning the bones of the legs of Tyrannosaurus rex. They got uh, femur leg bones, and if you slice the leg bone uh, transparently thin and put it under a microscope, you can actually see growth rings, a little bit like the growth rings on a tree trunk, and you can count those up and tell how old it died. And although the Tyrannosaurus rex they looked at was full-sized, they found that it had died in its 20s. And another Tyrannosaurus rex was sectioned and studied, and that one died in his 20s. And the next one, and the next one. People have found a lot of Tyrannosaurus rex adults, and they've looked at a lot of these bones. Only one Tyrannosaurus that they found so far lived long enough to see its 30th birthday. All of the others died in their 20s. So that shows us, first of all, that a T-Rex grew fast. They got up to their full, you know, five or six ton adult size within just 10 or 15 years. They were fast growing animals. And the other thing it shows us is that uh, they died young. Life is cheap in the Cretaceous. Uh, very, very cool. This is the thing is that even when I was a kid, we didn't know half of this stuff. It is the most exciting time ever to be a kid interested in dinosaurs. Like we know so much, we're finding so much more. It's just such a thrilling time to be in science in general. So, so cool for you guys. All right, we're going to take two Californian questions to wrap up today. Mr. Pettix is class live and I'll take one from YouTube before we wrap up. Uh, so Mr. Pettix, come on up. Go for it, guys. Hey. Hi, this is Brody. Hi. So we're loud. How? Oh, did you freeze? Mr. Pettix, could you repeat that? Sorry, it froze just ever so briefly. Oh, yeah, do you want to say it loud? Real loud. How big is the T Rex? How big is the T Rex, too? Buddy. All right. It is this big. Um, here's, here's how long it is compared to my arm. So it's about the size of my forearm. You look like you're a bit smaller than I am. So it's probably even longer than your arm, probably all, almost all the way from your wrist to your shoulder. But here is a good comparison that you can make next time you come uh, to a grocery store because a T-Rex tooth is about the size of a banana. Next time you see a banana, picture a tooth that size, and you've got a good idea of what the uh, T-Rex's dental armament would look like. Great question, buddy. Thank you so, so much. And I want to go to Miss Shelton's class in Northern California. They want to know, where have the most fossils been found in the world, Russell? Ooh, well, that is a very difficult question uh, to answer because... Um, Different kinds of fossils are found in different parts of the world, and uh, they um, 
you know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and guess. I can't emphasize enough the word guess, but I'm going to guess Morocco. Uh, there are layers of rock in Morocco. <laughs> we call them Morocco rocks. Why not? Uh, that are just chock full of the shells of ancient sea creatures, um, like orthocones. An orthocone had a, a straight shell shaped like a cone, and when it was alive, there was a head sticking out of the opening with uh, tentacles growing out of its face. Oh, picture a party hat and then stick an octopus into it, and you've basically got an orthocone. Anyways, uh, the rocks in Morocco are so chock full of these orthocones that people uh, get slices of these rocks and make them into plates and bowls and candle holders, and uh, they're just loaded with all of these little orthocone fossils, and it uh, makes very um, very decorative stuff. It's really cool, uh, and so that would be that would be my guess. Now, if we're talking about vertebrates. There is a layer of rock in southwestern Wyoming, the Green River Formation, and in those rocks are skeletons of a little fish called Nitea, kind of looked like a herring. It's been estimated there are 8 billion skeletons of Nitea in southwestern Wyoming, which would make it the most abundant fossil vertebrate in the world, and that would make southwestern Wyoming the winner uh, in terms of vertebrate uh, fossils. So yeah, it all depends, and it's a difficult question. It is, but I love your answer, and I love that you highlighted Morocco. I really encourage when people are done this broadcast, check out Morocco's trilobite fossils, which are, mm -hmm. I think, the most beautiful, perfectly formed fossils ever. Like, they're just yeah, so, so cool. Um, so do check those out. Uh, Russell, this has been so, so much fun. What I want to do before we wrap up, I want to highlight a great book for people to check out. If you guys are keen, Steve Broussat, Dr. Steve Broussat, The Age of Dinosaurs for Kids, just a fantastic book. So if you have kids in your class, if you guys are kids and you're super into dinosaurs, check out this book. If you want to learn more about Russell and the amazing work of the Tate Geological Museum, it's a little unwieldy, but check out this link to Casper College at EDU. Good stuff, and I can pass this to any teacher after the fact as well. And what I want to do, Russell, I want to bring in all our classes, Errol Village, Miss Lefford, Mr. Hancock, Miss Moore, Mr. Pettix. Is it a blood what fun. I'll bring you guys all back in two seconds. I just want to say, Russell, what a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for joining us for the first time. My You're pleasure. Your pants and 300 plus kids from all around the world joined today. What a good day. Awesome. All right, guys, I'll end the broadcast there. Get ready to say that big goodbye again. Yes. Yes.